There's just a whole lot of things in the world that seem to, that we need a good explanation for. And, and it just naturalism, even in some of the points where it can offer kind of an explanation, I found that theism offers a way better explanation, ultimately. There's some, there's some where naturalism offers no explanation at all. But even where it might have an explanation, the theistic one is almost always a lot better. Hello, and thanks for joining in. I'm Dana Harmon, and you're listening to Cybe Stories, where we see how skeptics flip the record of their lives. Each podcast, we listen to someone who has once been an atheist or skeptic, but who became a Christian against all odds. You can hear more of these stories at our Cybe Stories website at www.cybestories.com. We welcome your comments on these stories on our Facebook page. You can also email us at info at sidebestories.com. We'd love to hear from you. There are different stories, we believe, that help us make sense of the world around us and the world within us. Some are religious stories. Some are scientific, naturalistic, or secular stories. When it comes to the question of God and what is ultimate reality, oftentimes we adopt the stories and beliefs of those around us without giving them much thought. And we quickly dismiss other beliefs as false without much intentional investigation to arrive at a thoughtful conclusion. We may find something wrong with the other and reject it without much effort to really find out what we are embracing or whether or not it is even true. But there are those who don't just accept beliefs on face value. They are bent towards intellectual rigor and honesty even if it takes them down an intellectual path they never thought they would go. In today's story, philosopher and former atheist Pat Flynn thought carefully about things. Even as a child, he was haunted by the big questions of reality and existence. He wanted to make the best sense of reality, and it took him on an honest, diligent investigation, first towards naturalism and belief in atheism. But it was his continued thoughtful search for truth that led him out of atheism and towards belief in God. I hope you'll come along to hear his story. Well, welcome to Side B Stories, Pat. It's so great to have you with me today. Jana, it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. As we're getting started, I'd love for you to introduce yourself. Tell me a little bit about you, where you live, your family perhaps, and even your interests, uh, your your academic background, your, your, I know you are a generalist. So I'm just curious what all of that is all about. Sure. Oh boy. I'll try to keep it as concise as possible. I am a Christian. I'm a husband. Uh, I'm a father of five children. We have one boy and the rest are girls, a full quiver, as I've heard it said. And uh, we live in, we live in Waukesha, Wisconsin. I have gone through my master's in philosophy and my interests include writing, research. Uh, I've been a lifelong musician, so I play in a local band here. That keeps me pretty busy. Trying to fill the band out with my own family members. Uh, I have my own band and kickball team is, I guess, the eventual goal uh, here. Um, uh, very much into martial arts and, and fitness as well. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to ask what kind of music. Yeah, I am, I am your just classic rock kind of guy. I grew up, uh, some of my earliest memories of just my mom playing her favorite Van Halen and ACDC tapes in the car. Uh, so that just got me hooked at a very early age. I, I knew I just wanted to be a guitar player. Uh, I'm very blessed to have the ability to uh, pursue those interests and share it with my family and friends and stuff like that. Yes. And you said martial arts and physical fitness, did you say? Yeah. So I, a, a lot of it's very hard to sort of describe what I do because it's sort of all over the place. Uh, but when I was going to school for um, um, nothing fitness related, um, I was really into martial arts. I was on the competitive Taekwondo team and I grew up in a very inactive household. I was very unhealthy growing up. I was actually quite overweight. And in high school, I decided uh, sort of had enough of that. And I started out um, in my fitness journey through martial arts. I sort of just randomly walked into a martial arts studio was Taekwondo. And the instructor at the time became a good friend and mentor of mine, introduced me uh, just to sort of the basics of physical culture and physical fitness and nutrition and eating and stuff like that. So I fell in love with it, uh, pursued it very heavily, and, you know, went and got all sorts of certifications and stuff so I could personal train and and sort of do that as my my job through college. 
And I started a YouTube channel teaching uh, kettlebells and, and basic fitness. And that sort of kind of took off a little bit and, and led to some, some books. Uh, and I'm still doing that uh, to this day. So it is very hard to describe what I do because I, I do a lot of different things from philosophy uh, to fitness uh, in terms of my business and then a lot of just other side interests and, and hobbies and stuff I enjoy doing as well. It sounds like you've got a full life, a good life. So let's start at the early part of your life uh, and tell us where sure. you were born. Tell me about your family, the kind of the world that you grew up in and what that looked like in terms of any kind of um, touch of religion or God. Was it there yeah. or was it absent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was there, but in a in a very thin and unserious sense. So I was I was born in Pennsylvania, and my dad's job moved this around quite a bit. And growing up, um, religion was there. It was there mostly, I would say, on one side of the family with with my grandparents. And I'll I'll come back and maybe share a bit of that story later because it affected me more than I realized at the time. And that's the that's the fun thing about having conversations like these. You you kind of think back and. There's always new layers that you discover about your own story that you didn't quite realize at first. My, my grandparents probably played a more significant role in my eventual religious conversion than I initially realized. But anyways, we were the, we were the type of religious family that um, are commonly called priesters. You know, we would go to church maybe on Christmas and Easter. But it was, it was even worse than that. We would really sort of only go to church at least at a certain point on Christmas and Easter when the grandparents were in town type of thing. Nice. Um, yes. So it was, it was there, it was, it was present, but it was never seriously discussed. You know, we never, we never, uh, I was never properly catechized or, or anything like that. We never had religious conversation. Um, I remember occasionally my parents would even make jokes about religion. So it wasn't something that was, it wasn't something that was taken seriously. It wasn't something that was lived seriously. Uh, so however it was there, it was sort of, yeah, I guess a sort of cultural, uh, background, if you will. Mm. Otherwise, it was a very thoroughly secular mm. upbringing for the most part. Ma'am, so it sounds like it was a part of your life, very small part of your life, just something that you did every once in a while to to impress the grandparents, <laughs> but not much else. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's I, th I think that's fair. Mm -hmm. it, se it seemed unimportant, and you know, so. When it came to a point in my life, without skipping ahead uh, too quickly, where there seemed to be conflicts between um, the, the the commitments coming from the faith, the little that I understood, and call it the the wider scientific worldview, it was very much easy for me to let go of those those previous religious beliefs or commitments. What was religion characterized as, or why would not it, why would it not cohere with a scientific worldview for you at that time? Yeah, so I remember um, one of the, you know, you always look back and you and you try to analyze where where did things take a turn, and I can actually remember quite specifically. This was in the the sixth grade, so this will reveal my age. I was in the sixth grade when nine eleven happened, and I didn't I didn't really appreciate it at the time. But what happened is I was faced with what are probably the two most prominent objections to the existence of God. And they weren't explicit in my mind, but they both hit me that same year. And the first one came from when my science teacher was sort of outlining, you know, in a, as much as you would get in the sixth grade, the origins of the universe story, Big Bang cosmology and, and all that, you know, very basics. But it was, it was obvious enough that, hey, this doesn't seem like the story I was taught from the Bible, right? Right. <laughs> right. Of creation sure. and, and Abba and Eve and where's the snake and all that. Right. So in a very elementary way, you could see that there was a, a, you know, a conflict here, right? These stories just didn't seem like the same story. Right. So it seems like, you know, science has got this science can explain it. We don't need God. That's the, that's the first objection I was, I was hit with in the, in the sixth grade, mm -hmm. but sixth grade was also when nine 11 happened. Right. And I remember because we, we, we watched it on the TV. We were one of those schools that got in a lot of trouble afterwards for letting all the kids just sort of see it happen, right? Which was very traumatic for a lot of kids. And this this really opened my eyes. And not that I never had any difficulties in life before this, but to the profound problem of evil, mm -hmm. right? Like this was a, an awful, terrible thing that happened. Yes. We watched it on television. Um, and yeah, many kids were rightfully traumatized. I'm sure I was to some extent as well. Uh, so yeah, that year was was pretty significant for me. I didn't throw my my hands up and, you know, declare myself an atheist 
on the spot. But whatever happened that year was the beginning of a, a, of a seed of doubt that would continue to grow over time as I started thinking more seriously about bigger questions, becoming more interested in philosophy, which I did in high school, that would sort of veer me down a naturalistic, atheistic path. I can, I can definitely trace it back to that, <laughs> to that year in the sixth grade. And I always found it very fascinating because, you know, many years later, I'm sure we'll get to this. Uh, I discovered Thomas Aquinas and when he considers objections against the existence of God, he, he considers two and the two he considers. And for Aquinas is interesting because he usually considers like a million objections to positions, but for God, he only considers two and the two he considers are the problem of evil and essentially the science objection. But for him, it was, aren't the principles of nature enough? We don't really need God right. to explain anything. And, right. and so I kind of connected that's like, by golly, those were the two objections that I was hit with, even not explicitly in the sixth grade. And they, they really rattled me at that time. So, you know, it takes, you know, for, so yeah, it's a more complicated story than that, but it, it definitely, it definitely, I think really significantly started there, my doubt and, and movement away from whatever little religion I had mm. growing up. As you were moving away from religion, what did you consider religion to be? Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question. I guess I didn't consider it to be much of anything because I didn't really think about it a whole lot. And the only times I really did think about it were in these instances where it seemed like whatever I was told about religion, which I guess would have just been a, a broad mere Christianity a sort of crude, um, yeah, kindergarten sort of theology, if you, if you will. Um, the truth that, yeah, the truth is I probably didn't think about it hardly at all, except for, uh, on, in the, in that very thin way that I could see that there were two different stories being right. told. They and it was just not together. the true story. One of them right. seemed, one of them, yeah, one of them seemed unimportant and trivial and outdated yes. and that nobody around me took seriously, including my family. And the other one seemed like the credible story that smart people right. believe. So it was very easy for me to dismiss the other one, if that makes right. sense. Mm -hmm. Right. Without thinking about it too much. It just seemed like for you, right. the natural path to go was towards naturalism, right? Yes. Yeah. So as you were walking along this journey, was it something that you took seriously that you started looking in more strategically or was it just by entering into the scientific view of reality that that's just something you mm -hmm. you gradually embraced more and more through your um through your studies and i guess into philosophy yeah yeah, yeah it's interesting because there's always different um influences in your life and i had a lot that sort of pointed me towards an, an atheistic naturalistic uh direction, uh, and from many different areas. So I already mentioned, uh, you know, my love for music and for better or worse, probably for worse at the time, but things have seemed to all kind of come together in a positive way. Most of the music I was listening to, uh, and most of the people I admired in music seemed pretty anti-religious, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Um, and you know, these were people that I kind of admired. Also, musicians—they're cool. I want to be like them, and they—they they seem to be against this sort of thing. So that was that was that was something. Other writers that I was really into, especially by high school, I was really into Mark Twain, and I can remember another kind of like uh, important point in my thinking was there was a, an essay by by Mark Twain uh, called "What Is Man." And it's an essay really pushing like a very hard sort of determinism, an essay against sort of free will and man as this sort of machine where history sort of just passes through us, right? Rather than our being to affect history in any sort of meaningful way. I remember being really jarred by that um, because I guess even at that time I was still committed to an idea that I had real agency and free will, but I didn't know how to answer it or respond to it at the time. And it actually seemed pretty convincing so it wasn't anything like directly in, in science that, that cinched me, right? It was, it was these, these other considerations. And from there, I, I did start getting into, into philosophy proper. Another writer that I found f fairly early on that was very interesting to me was a guy named H.L. Mencken. And he was, uh, 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 oh boy, he was a crotchety old atheist. And he always railed against religion. And he had one of the first books out in English at the time on Nietzsche. And so at some point I picked that up and that sort of opened up that world to me, this sort of the, the, the world of sort of the old atheist, existentialist, absurdist perspective. And I was gripped by it. 
I was fascinated by it. I was haunted by it for many different reasons. I couldn't turn away from it. Uh, I was intermittently convinced by it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I say inter- intermittently convinced by it because the, the deeper I went into the naturalistic worldview, the more it seemed fundamentally at odds with other things that I was still committed to. I mentioned free will right. and, and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, intermittently committed to denying things that otherwise seemed undeniable. And at, at around at around this point, I forget how many years down the line we are, I start to, you know, even though I would have considered myself a naturalist at the time, more and more tensions within that worldview are starting to sort of sort of bubble up as because I, I am interested in trying to make sense of reality. I always was even even going way back before the sixth grade. Jan, I remember I'd be at my grandparents house and I would I would just kind of look out out their out their window and I kind of ask, you know, how. Why does why is any of this right? Why is any of this? You know your your big questions of like contingency. I didn't think of it at that time, but just like why is any of this, or how do I know any of this is real? Mm-hmm. How do I know I'm not dreaming right. or sleeping or, or or any of that stuff? Right. So for whatever reason, I will I was always haunted by the big philosophical questions for for as long as I can remember, and I thought maybe I would get answers to them through a particular naturalistic avenue. Um, and initially, that seemed like I was going to like you know the sort of the scientism has got this, right? And that's what led me down that path. But the deeper I got into it, the more I realized, no, this is not, this is not adequate to handle reality. This is not adequate to explain the things that I need to be explained for me. And in fact, it seems the deeper I go into this worldview, the more it has to kind of eliminate or explain away things that are so fundamental, I don't think they could be coherently denied. Call them like a a slew of Morian facts, if you will, like things like free will, consciousness um consciousness was was a big one for me uh the moral landscape the objective moral landscape right moral duties and 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 values and stuff like that the more i kept going into this this atheistic naturalistic paradigm the more it seemed like i was being forced uh unless i was willing to really contrive the worldview and hypothesis more was being forced to say that these things aren't what they seem to be Right, that these that these things aren't real in the way that they sure seem to be <laughs> to be real. Right, they're they're illusions. Uh, I'm suffering under delusions or, or, or things like that. Maybe I'm not even real. Right, maybe I'm just like a, a bundle of, of particles. Right, stuff like that. And at some point, those tensions came to be too much mm. that I realized I don't know what what the truth is. I've been trying to find it. I don't. I have no idea what the truth is. But this is definitely not it. Mm. This is definitely not it. I've gone down. I have made a mistake. Somewhere I made a mistake and have set down the wrong path. And that's when I I didn't become a theist. I didn't become religious immediately. But at least sort of took a step back and and told myself, I need to take another look at things. I need to consider new perspectives. And this was definitely post-college now at, at, at this point. I would have been married and with at least one or two of my children by the time I reached that point. Mm-hmm. It. it- strikes me that oftentimes um, there is a dismissal of God or Christianity or faith and an embracing of the other, a godless worldview, without really looking deeply into what it is that someone is embracing. You know, they may know what they're rejecting or they may not even know fully what they're rejecting, They, but they don't really know what they're fully embracing. And it sounds to yes. me like... I guess because of your your curiosity, your inquisitive mind, your your tendency to think about the big questions that you were willing actually to look into the bottom of the the, the box um, and and see where the implications flow from the ideas of naturalism and that they lead to a, a really kind of a dark or dismal place and that that is unlivable. It reminds me of, how Francis Schaeffer talks about that we are God's creatures living in God's world. And when our, when our views and our lives don't match with reality, there's a tension that comes that has to be resolved. And it sounds like you had a sense of cognitive dissonance about that. Um, probably a bit of existential dissonance about that as well, because ideas aren't just merely theoretical. It's true. When I sort of moved away from religion and, and towards naturalism, 
I didn't fully under, understand it. It took, I mean, there's a lot there to dive into. It took me years and years of, of trying, of studying different thinkers and looking into different uh, issues to really feel like I kind of understood the naturalistic paradigm. And, and, and to be totally fair, there's m- many different naturalistic thinkers and they think about things in many different ways. But the, the core commitments to me seemed something like this, that there's a naturalistic grand narrative uh, and it's, it's committed to a sort of broad scientism where whatever else reality is comprised of or whatever we can know about reality, it's going to, you know, kind of come from the the sciences, you know, and preferably the hard sciences, right? So whatever exists is going to kind of be what chemistry and physics tells us about, or at least shouldn't be like repugnant to that sort of microphysical base, right? So you've got atomic theory and you've got evolutionary theory, and that's supposed to kind of like more or less explain it all, right? Um, and then you try to run that through, and you try to, uh, well, uh, for, I mean, first, I think there's just certain things that, that that can't even begin to explain, um, just obviously so. Like, why is there why is there anything instead of nothing instead, right? That, that is obviously a question so so broad that science can't touch it. I mean, science is, is, is etiological. It looks at how physical processes unfold over time, right, and how they relate. But it cannot, in principle, answer the question of why are there any physical processes at all, right? Mm-hmm. So immediately there's a huge question that, that naturalism just seems wholly incapable of, of answering, uh, at least within its own sort of framework of knowledge or epistemology. I didn't realize that at the time. I came to realize it later. But even within it, you start to get these big issues of, of, of explanatory problems. I identified three of, of morality, of consciousness, of free will, where at least to me, it seemed like these realities are so obvious. They're more obvious than any potential step in an argument for naturalism against them, <laughs> right? That I, I, I should, I should, I should, I think, and I did be more willing to give up whatever the commitments are that are pushing me towards naturalism than these, than these basic obvious realities, right? These, these very basic obvious realities. And that's sort of what I, that's sort of what I did, right? When I kind of surveyed the the range of naturalistic options of trying to make sense of not just consciousness, but, but rationality as well, formal thinking and stuff like that. There's a lot of deep technical issues that I'd never found anything close to an adequate answer for in, in the naturalistic accounts, meaning, semantic content, um, the, the moral dimension, as we, as we, as we spoke about, uh, human freedom of the will, uh, contingency, but even, you know, going out from there, uh, the data concerning religious experiences, mystical experiences, uh, near death experiences, there's just a whole lot of things in the world that seem to, that we need a good explanation for. And, and it just naturalism, even in some of the points where it can offer kind of an explanation, I found that theism offers a way better explanation. Ultimately there's some, there's somewhere naturalism offers no explanation at all. But even where it might have an explanation, the theistic one is almost always a lot better, right? And then you just got to have something to say about the the problem of evil at some point, which is I, I wrestled with that as well, obviously. Um, but but to your point is yes, I didn't know fully what I was stepping into at first. That that became clear over time as I tried to take it seriously and find answers because that's what I was really interested in were were answers fundamentally, right? But nor when I sort of realized I was on a wrong path that I go back and adopt theism right away i just i just sort of threw my hands up <laughs> i don't know what's going on here right I, I think i know enough to say that this this is the wrong path but i don't know what path to take after this as well so i sort of i guess return to a, a a more agnostic position and just just wanting to consider other perspectives i'd like to take a break to let you know about some additions we've been making to these side b stories episodes that give you more than one way to benefit from them first of all we've been recording these podcasts on video as well as audio so if you're interested in seeing as well as hearing these amazing stories of atheists and skeptic conversions hop on over to our side b stories youtube channel we have been posting the last few episodes in video and plan to continue doing that for all new episodes as well as working our way backward through our side b stories catalog as well just go on over to youtube and search for side b stories and you should find the stories and videos there Secondly, for those of you who would like to read these Sybeast conversion stories, we have also been transcribing each episode to make it easier to look back on their journeys in print. 
If you're interested in this, most of the episode transcripts, except for the most recent few, are now available on the C.S. Lewis Institute website. That's www.cslewisinstitute.org. Again, we are a podcast of the C.S. Lewis Institute, and that's why this connection. So once you go to the C.S. Lewis website, look for resources, select podcasts, and there you'll find Side B Stories. Under each story, find and select where it says More Info, and there you'll find the transcripts. We hope to have all of these up on our Side B Stories website soon as well. Now, back to our story. Isaiah, just I'm curious of your opinion before we step forward in your story. There are you read a lot of very astute, um, you know, the brights, uh, the intellectuals who were convinced naturalists. I wonder, again, from your your perspective, it's often touted that you know the naturalistic view is the more rational view, the more rational belief. But yet, as you've so clearly defined, there are a lot of things that don't make sense with reality when you look at the you know the depths of naturalism that it doesn't make sense that i'm not choosing you know this or that that is actually you know forces or impulses or environmental pressures that are that are causing me to to think or to or what i'm saying or what i where i'm moving or the choices i'm you know choosing that that it seems so counterintuitive, yet the atheist oftentimes grabs hold with gusto to this worldview that when you look at it closely doesn't seem to make sense. It seems that they are making irrational choices in order to remain on this position. Why do you suppose that is? Yeah, that's a that's a wonderful question. I don't know. I have a, have a, a totally great answer to it, but I can speak from my experience. Um, one is again, I think, related to superficial understandings of religion and worldview comparison, like I had starting out. Right. So you think that there's the worldview of religion, which is often presented in a hokey, superstitious fashion, and there's a worldview of science, and we should like science. Why? Because it's powerful. It does stuff. It has given us great technology, We've been able to just sort of tame a lot of, of nature and build impressive things and treat uh, formidable diseases. So clearly, science is, is cool. So this is a sort of science rocks argument, right? We shouldn't go beyond science. But then the immediate question to answer there is like, well, why did, or to ask is the question to ask is, well, does atheism have a, a monopoly on science, right? Like, like, if I go with science, do I have to go with atheism or naturalism? And the obvious answer is no, <laughs> it's, it's not, right? So the science, the science rocks argument is, is irrelevant, at least initially, right? Because science fits just as well with theism. In fact, I would go further. I would say the fundamental core commitments of science, properly understood, are, are far better fit within a theistic worldview than a naturalistic worldview. What are some of these commitments? Well, that the world is intelligible right? That reality actually makes sense. That something like the principle of sufficient reason is true, that there are coherent questions that we can ask. And to all those coherent questions, there is a coherent answer. And as many philosophers will tell you, if you accept that principle of sufficient reason, that sets you up for a pretty powerful argument for the existence of God. But it seems like something like that sort of lurking behind science, at least we're kind of operating according to that, right? That's sort of what is driving the scientific enterprise, that reality can be figured out, right? That we're not just going to wind up with tons of brute absurdities, right? Things that just are with no explanation whatsoever, right? right? Science also has a great has a great number of moral assumptions, right? That you should investigate honestly. You should report your findings honestly. You shouldn't lie about things, right? Okay. It seems like we want a foundation for that. Science, I would argue in a deeper sense, is committed to a sort of broad essentialism, that there are things that have common natures uh, that we can really learn things about through controlled experiments. And then, and then yeah, I think that that's going to kind of hold in a stable, regular way uh, in, in the wider scenario. 
But that's a traditional commitment of theism, right? That God just gives existence to certain natures, stability, order. These things are b- below supporting science and are the sort of things you would expect from a theistic worldview. They're not the sorts of things that you would expect from a naturalistic worldview. What's a naturalistic worldview? Well, it's a worldview where whatever else fundamental reality is, it's run by a principle of indifference. There's no entity down there in the basement of reality that is totally benevolent or malevolent. It's just totally indifferent, right? But the problem is, like, if that's your, your, your bedrock principle, whereas theism is actually a principle of absolute perfection, right? There's not much you really expect from that. I mean, what do you just expect from a principle of indifference? The answer is nothing, right? I don't expect anything from that. So then you got to sort of like start complicating your hypothesis in various ways to try and account for the data. But that's not a great thing because we think the more you have to complicate your hypothesis, the more likely it's it's going to turn out to be false, right? We think of like simplicity as a, as a theoretical virtue. Whereas theism is a very simple principle. You know, God is just this being a pure perfection, pure actuality. And from that through, you know, a motivation of goodness, we can kind of expect a world like ours with all these structures and order and stability and intelligibility and beauty and the moral dimension, all the stuff that makes sense of science, right? So I, I would say it's the superficial thing that I think leads to comments like theism is irrational. But when you take a more substantial look, Jana, um, and this is philosopher I like very much, Alvin Plantinga's famous thesis. He's got a book called Where the Conflict Really Lies. And that's exactly his thesis. He says, okay, superficially, you might think there's a conflict between, you know, science and the religious worldview. But once we take a deeper look, the real conflict is between naturalism and science. And he's got all sorts of arguments for for why that's the case. But I think that's fundamentally true. And I think the fundamental issue is people are still operating on those superficial look so superficial inspections as i was this is not to say that of course there's many smart professional naturals out there very very smart and they would disagree with that and we would just have to have those arguments but but that isn't most people i think most people when they say things like that it's because they they've only taken that superficial look but also the smart naturals the professional ones that i talk to and and like to read and engage with they don't say theism is irrational not most of them anyways mm-hmm. Uh, they're mostly interested in trying to just show that naturalism isn't irrational, right? It's kind of the reverse of what you see on the popular level. They're just trying to more or less say, okay, you know, theism is, is re- most of them are happy to admit that theism is a very reasonable position, but they're just trying to show that a naturalist position is, is reasonable as well. So once you kind of get to the smartest people in this debate, you don't usually see language like that mm. anymore. It's, it's much more, um, not just sophisticated, Nuanced. but uh, modest, I would say. Yeah, nuanced yeah. and modest, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And through this time, it sounds like this is taking us into, through University of Study Philosophy and on into marriage, did you ever have any touch points with any intelligent Christians who were willing or able to discuss these issues with you at all, or were they just absent? Yeah, that's a... That's a good question. And the answer is, for the most part, until I had really already sort of taken the turn to Christianity, no. Um, uh, Pretty much all of my friends, with with one exception of somebody who was very, very faithful, but not not coming from a philosophical perspective at all, but was still a, a very good example to me. And again, I think influenced me more than I realized at the time through that example. All my friends were not only not religious, I would say many of them were quite anti-religious. So it was really a kind of a lonely, <laughs> kind of a lonely study. <laughs> I largely conducted up in my in my attic in my in my old house for many many years, reading and, and researching. And then once I had finally kind of more or less worked my way to the, to the Christian perspective, then I, I started getting the boldness to want to reach out to certain people and, and make connections. So they they were there and, and they helped um, very willingly and I, I have formed many wonderful friendships from that. But starting out, uh, no, um, and I, I suppose it was just sort of the environment I, I crafted. You know, I was not a religious person, so it sort of makes sense that my my surroundings, my my friend my friend group and my peers and everybody else in my life was just not a religious person either. And that that leads to that's a, that's a hard thing too. You know. Um, because once we started to make, and I say we, because my wife had her own conversion, um, quite different than mine, but 
you know, running alongside of mine, it causes you or encourages you at least to change your environment in, in, in pretty dramatic ways. Um, and as always, stories are complicated yes. and not everything about my conversion was, was intellectual either. Well, sure. So there's, there's always a lot going on and a lot to kind of Absolutely. Yeah. Unpacked. Version entails mm-hmm. something more than intellectual, but, um, yeah. So let, so let's go back to that place then where you were having some tension or issues uh, yeah. with naturalism and feeling some sense of dissatisfaction and you were th- thinking perhaps naturalism wasn't it, but you weren't willing to look at that time at least towards Christianity or, or that, um, take us there. Yeah, sure. So, my uh, my immediate, <clears throat> I did have one one friend that was religious at the time. He was a Hindu, actually, a pretty devout Hindu. Ne- we never really talked religion much, but I was always sort of interested in his thought. Very very smart guy, very very smart guy, and um, still a great friend of mine. So my immediate interest was, I, I guess, this is just the sort of the bias of a secular American upbringing. Is like, okay, well, whatever else might be the case, it probably isn't Christianity, right? I still had this very anti-Christian bias, <laughs> right. so I started looking right. towards Eastern thought and and pagan and paganism, Eastern thoughts of paganism. So you know, you know, just through my study of philosophy, I always had like a a passing introduction and familiarity with you know the old pagans, Aristotle and Plato. So I, I really wanted to go back to those guys, uh, a large part, but I also. Um, was very interested in, in, in Eastern thought at, at large, particularly uh, Buddhist thought as well, and other thinkers that I had read independently. Um, I know they had thoughts on religion and, and religious belief and, and God and spiritual practices. In fact, um, uh, one book that I remember early on reading was um, Huxley's Perennial Philosophy. Uh, and that was a, a very interesting book for me because – you know, Aldous Huxley was the uh, uh, was the guy who wrote Brave New World, and I remember liking his his work a lot. And his book, Perennial Philosophy, was sort of a statement of of religious pluralism, a, blo- a, a broad religious pluralism. Like, hey, you know, all religions are um, they're all true but false, and that's that's the sort of naive way of stating it. But the more sophisticated way of stating it is like, look, all religions are groping towards some some transcendence, some transcendence that is, it's there, it's, it's real, but they're all, they're all wrong. They're doing the best they can. Um, but you know, here's, here's their commonalities and we can see their commonalities. And I'm sure you've heard the line and your, your listeners are familiar. And, and his book was, was an interesting read on that. And it, and it sort of opened me up to sophisticated, what seemed otherwise non, um, traditionally religious people thinking about God. Um, and same thing with going back to the other, other pagans and, and Aristotle and, and Plato and all these guys, they all seem to, to believe in God. It wasn't immediately clear that it was the same God that the Christians believed in or stuff like that. But all of this sort of really getting me interested in the God question in general and, and ultimately projects of natural theology. Is God something we can think about? Are there reasons to, to believe in God? And if so, can we know anything about God? Is there one? Is there more than one? Is God the universe? Right? Is pantheism true? Is, is monotheism true in, in some form or other? So I got sucked into that. I, I became utterly fascinated in the God question first and foremost because it seems the most fundamental, right? Um, we're right. getting at the, the, the basement of reality because whatever else God is supposed to be, God is supposed to be like the fundamental explanatory principle. So I got... Uh, I went down that route for quite some time and, and read as much as I possibly could on it um, and and became increasingly convinced of the classical theistic paradigm uh, that, that that a robust monotheism is true, uh, that this was the best explanatory worldview. And in terms of religious beliefs at the time, nothing, you know, uh, no firm commitments, but I guess I was sort of broadly attracted to this this religious, pluralism, uh, idea. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, and again, it's hard to, my memory isn't great, but at some point I I came across Thomas Aquinas and the great like Thomistic tradition, the people who follow Thomas Aquinas and a lot of great philosophers in that tradition that had a, a great influence on me from Bernard Lonergan to Norris Clark. And I was really impressed 
with these thinkers. Really impressed. And, and, and the way I always like to present and think about it is some people think of Aquinas as like the first great medieval philo- philosopher. I always think of him as like the last great classical philosopher. To me, he's the guy who just pulled all the, thre- the uh, threads together, right? right. And there's a beautiful tapestry, this beautiful coherent picture of reality, soup to nuts, metaphysics, ethics, all of it, human anthropology. Like he just seemed to be able to answer those questions that I was looking um, for answers to, questions of why is there anything uh, what are we, <laughs> right? How are we supposed to live? How metaphysics informs ethics? And the beautiful thing about the Thomistic picture is it seemed not just comprehensive, uh, but systematic, great coherence, and it didn't cause me to like have to eliminate any of those core commitments that I thought were so important, but was able to ground them, right? Nice. Now, the 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 problem, I suppose, of reading a bunch of uh, Thomas and Dominicans, especially Thomas himself, is they talk a lot about Christianity. <laughs> yeah. And these people are really smart. Um, and I was really interested in it from a philosophical perspective, but you can't really ignore that, right? You can't really ignore like, okay, could somebody who I think is this brilliant, this correct about one thing be so totally wrong about another? And maybe, I mean, sometimes that's the case. Like I think there's many brilliant naturalists and they have a lot of great contributions, but I think that they, they are totally off on uh, other things as well. So maybe that's the case. But at some point along the way, I began to become seriously interested in the question of Christianity. Uh, and, and also the truth is, is looking into the different Eastern religions didn't really cut it for me. They, they, I think they have a host of philosophical issues uh, or just weren't very philosophically deep at all. And, you know, so that wasn't doing it for me, I guess, <laughs> in a sense, right? Especially the sort of, sort of, um, uh, broad Buddhist stuff that I was kind of into at the time. Um, so this is where I took the turn towards seriously looking at, at Christianity. And, and to me, the most obvious thing at that point was to see if there was any sort of credible historical basis for it. And that's where um, I became utterly fascinated by the, the Christian apologetic scene mm-hmm. on that front and read as much as, as I could on it for my own fascination uh, and, and, and just to try and answer my own questions. And ultimately I came to the conclusion that there is a very credible historical basis for the core claims of, claims of Christianity, who, yeah. specifically who the incarnation authors? and atonement, resurrection. Yeah. Who were, who were the authors? Well, I, I'm, yeah, somebody who, who I know influences a lot of people that whose, whose work I, I found very helpful was, um, Dr. Dr. William Lane Craig. He's got a nice little book called, I think it was called The Sun Rises. I remember finding that book very helpful. And then going much deeper into that, N.T. Wright's Resurrection of the Son of God, I found really, really helpful. Dr. Brant Petrie has a book, The Case for Jesus, which I found really helpful. And to me, I didn't I didn't need it like proven beyond any doubt. This is the important point I try to, to make to people. Because at this point, I was already pretty committed to a philosophical worldview that seemed to like in a sense, make probable something like Christianity, right? There's a background there where you might expect something like this. So then if there just is a sort of historical case to be made, right? And you've already got that philosophical background. There's a fittingness there where I think it becomes eminently reasonable, right? That that it doesn't, that at least for me, it didn't need to be proven beyond any shadow of a doubt whatsoever. It's just, oh no, this, this fits, Mm -hmm. This historical data fits really well with this philosophical paradigm I've already kind of found myself into. It's just sort of just the sort of thing I might expect, if you will, right? Even looking at it sort of retroactively, that would flow from essentially two things, right? Classical theism and the obvious fact that there's something screwy with the world, right? Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Something like Christianity makes a lot of sense of that, right? And the fact that there's any historical case to be made for it, let alone a strong historical case, I'm sure people are familiar with the usual historical apologetics around the resurrection, um, was sufficient for me to at least begin to say to my wife at the time, this was a very awkward conversation because she was she was never baptized and she grew up quite anti-religious, um, you know, to say, hey, I think we should... I think we should take a look at this. Uh, and at this point we had two children, I think. And we haven't even gotten to that side of the story, but obviously being married and having kids gives many perspectives on, on different things as yes. well, especially, especially for her. Uh, I think that was a, a big thing that, that opened her up to considering 
certain things, right? Um, so that was it. And then, you know, kind of together, but in, in different ways, we started seriously thinking about it and slowly trying to actually put ourselves around other Christian people and, and Christian communities and things sort of gradually uh, went from there. Mm -hmm. So you became, I guess, intellectually confident, convinced, maybe not with certainty, right? That there was the possibility, a real possibility of a transcendent source who informs all of reality that, uh, that again, that then through Aquinas and, and understanding some of his arguments for God or the existence of God, those made sense. And then you, from that flowed, okay, if God exists, then the potential for Christianity and Jesus is true. Just super fast for our listeners, what, what arguments does Aquinas present in a nutshell that seem to be convincing for you of God's existence? You've, you have this sort of cause effect type of first cause argument, right? Okay, there's all these things that need to have existence imparted to them, right? In order for them to be actively present in reality, right? Is this something that can just kind of go on indefinitely or in a circle or anything like that? And Aquinas has many arguments to say no. And this type of causal series, what he calls a per se or hierarchical causal series, he argues it's necessarily terminating. Right. If there were not a primary first cause that possessed the causal property of existence inherently, then it would never be in any of the intermediary causes or, or effects. Right. But for Aquinas, that's going to be a pretty remarkable first cause because it would have to be something whose essence just is existence. Right. It would just be exists with an exclamation point. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and for Aquinas, that's God because he's got a deep metaphysics of existence, uh, a theory of the transcendentals where where goodness and truth just are existence under different aspects, right? So as it turns out that, that God as a being of pure existence is actually going to be a being of pure truth, of pure goodness, that is the fundamental first and primary cause of everything else that exists, right? The direct, immediate, efficient cause of everything else that exists. I found that argument convincing then. I find it even more convincing now, the more that I've, that I've, I've studied it, right? That, that, again, I didn't need it proven from history completely because there's all this sort of philosophical stuff going in the background. Like, oh, yeah. That makes, that makes perfect right. sense. Right. So that's what did it. That's, that's what did it for me. But yeah, hopefully I can show the link there between his arguments for the existence of God, how they can actually inform and set you up, I think, for the, mm. for the Christian story being right. the true story as well. And that did, that did, a, that did a lot for me. It yeah. still does. You provided uh -huh. an adequate foundation for the historical uh, aspect of Christianity. So it was this beautiful kind of cumulative case in a sense of philosophy and history Plus, I would imagine, too, uh, it was fitting, speaking of fitting, it fit, it fit with your sense of, of self, of your existential needs and desires for things to make sense of reality, of who you are and, um, you know, your person, like, like you say, your, your continuing self or your consciousness or those kinds of things. It, it provided, it began to provide answers all the way around. Yeah. Um, and so it gave you a place that I guess intellectually allowed you to enter into from an experiential perspective, Christianity. And I, I, I now had a worldview where those commitments fit. They could be located in the grand narrative comfortably, whereas those commitments could not be located in the grand narrative of natural. That, that's not insignificant. That's not insignificant, right? Aquinas' view of the world with his focus on, you know, substances is, is fundamental helps make a lot of sense of human consciousness and free will and, and all this and, and god as a primary first cause the, the commitments fit within that narrative mm. they don't fit easily or at all within natural that's not an insignificant thing and i would just yeah ask people yeah. to kind of consider it, that, it, right like, mm -hmm. yeah it feels like you know at the beginning when you were when you were leaving kind of any god's you, you left the god story behind for the science story you know and now you're you're not leaving science behind, but you're you're seeing how science fits well within the God story where it didn't in the Godless story, I guess, and naturalism. Yeah, yeah. that's that's right. And yeah. I, and I think the science is, and I, yeah, I don't think science settles these bigger questions. There's there's you know certain things that are interesting in the sciences that that might be relevant to certain arguments here or there. 
But I do think as a whole, science makes a, a lot more sense on the theistic, on that mm, theistic picture. Right. I was kind of sneaky. <laughs> I just kind of like <laughs> slink into the back of, back of church every now and then and kind of scope it out, you know, I just kind of keep, keep my head down. And, uh, but I just felt so pulled at this point, uh, you know, to just to try it out and, and trying it because it was, you know, it's more than an intellectual thing, you know, um, mm-hmm. and talk about core commitments. One of the core commitments, this was really big for my wife, but it was for me too, is love, yes. right? Uh, yes. She had her first kid and she, she, she always tells this, this story. It's like, she felt such a profound sense of truly transcendent love that the sort of atheism she was at the time where this is all just axons firing for survival purposes. Like she just kind of knew immediately on the spot. That's, that's false. That's just false. I can't explain why it's false, but it's false, right? right? That's, this is, this is so far beyond that. Now, of course, that's not going to convince somebody the committed atheist will say, well, that's just still a delusion pressed into you from evolutionary forces. But here's the thing, right? If you have an experience like that of such an overwhelming seeming call it or obviousness of the reality of love, and you've got two stories, right? Science is neutral between them, right? Might even fit better with one. And one story says, hey, actually, the foundation reality is just a fountain of self-donating love, right? And the other one says the foundation of reality is just in different physical bits that somehow, through a process of combination, produce delusions that you call love, <laughs> I mean, which one are you going to go with? Right? <laughs> the exactly. other one, the other one, it's a lot better. <laughs> I'm going to go with that, that. But so like for my wife, that was the, the kid thing. And that true, that experience of just incredible love uh, was big for her. And it was for me too. I mean, ca- having kids really does change things um, in a profound way. Um, but me, I, I needed, I needed philosophical arguments and systems on, on top of that too. But everyone's experience is, is, a, is a little bit different, but, but, providentially the conversion of, of me and my wife sort of lined up um, in such a way that we were able to consider things in our own way, but on, um, you know, a, a similar time frame, if, if that makes well, sense. That, that's, that's, and, <laughs> and it was, it was hard because, you know, not only was it just, you know, going and, and, and trying to, to meet other Christian people, but, you know, speaking frankly, there there were a lot of lifestyle changes that that had to be made. Uh, we weren't exactly living according to Christian values and, and biblical teaching, but again, conversion is more than intellectual. Right. You know, there's that that moral conversion, and you know, if nothing else, I think you know, as wrong as I've been, and I'm sure I still have many things I still need to work out. Now, I've at least always tried to be consistent in what I believe. Um, and so it seemed absolutely right to me that if I think this is true and I think this is right, I, I've, I've got to reform my life. My whole family has got to reform our lives. We have to conform ourselves um, to living according to what Christ taught and biblical teaching and all that. So that was tough, uh, but, it, but it wasn't as tough as I thought it was going to be. And that, and, and that experience not only convinced me more of the truth of Christianity, but the reality of grace mm. as well. Because there were you know certain things that I thought, oh, that's going to be impossible, right? <laughs> Right. But they're not. They're not. Um, and and there's that that other experiential dimension. I don't even. I don't want to call it a testing. I don't think that's the, the right word. Uh, but but the, the openness and the the praying, you know, for God to help you to 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 do this right to 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 live according to what to right, to what Christ taught. Be open to grace. I became just personally convinced of that. Just just through the shifts we had to make in our lives. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love that you say it's the conversion is not merely intellectual. It's not, no, you can believe without surrender. And it sounds like you have submitted to the God who created all things, who created and purposed you too. And, uh, is very personal to you in, in ways that, that allow you to experience the fullness of him and the fullness of goodness and beauty and truth. Um, what an amazing story that you have. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add to your story? I, I'll mention my grandparents. Here's another line of providence so I can tie it all, all together. Because I said they were the, the one part of my family that um, they were such beautiful people. And my grandfather, you know, when he died, he was the kind of guy who everybody in the state came to his funeral because he was always just giving to others. And he was extremely devout. 
in his faith through his entire life and everybody loved him so much. And growing up, I always thought that that was like independent of his religious beliefs, right? Ah, he's just a good guy and just believes that sort of stuff. And now I realize, no, this was integral to, to who he was. And, you know, in my atheist years, I was very materialist and I was materialist and ironically in two senses, I was materialist in like the philosophical sense, but I was also materialist in like the consumerist sense. Um, yeah, I wanted things. I wanted to be successful and have the business and write the books and all that, all that stuff. And and uh, I remember when my grandparents passed, and this was at a time when I was really kind of going through. I forget exactly where I was on the conversion, but I was definitely on on the way towards Christianity. I remember uh, one of my uncles gave my 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 grandfather a very very ex- very expensive watch, and I was going to inherit it. So I was I was kind of excited about that, right? Um. But um, what what happened is uh, that watch went missing. So when I went to go get my inheritance from my from my grandparents, uh, the watch wasn't there. And literally, the only thing left in their house was just some uh, religious icons. That's it. That was the only thing huh. that was left in their house for me. That was it. And like to me, like that was. It was essentially God yelling at me at that point. <laughs> how old? Like it couldn't have been more obvious. How old were you at this time? Been, I was. I would have definitely been out of college. Um, An adult. Prior okay. to you know full c- conversion, uh, probably like probably like mid mid twenties, something like that. Okay. Mid mid yeah, yeah midish twenties. Um, and it just it was just one of those lines of providence. It was so so obvious. You know, more obvious to me than any like, you know, immediate like mystical vision could have been right of the life that I was supposed to leave behind and a life I was now supposed to live mm. from the people that meant so much to me and what was left behind from them. So that's, that's, that's what I, I think I'll, 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 I'll finish with there. <laughs> yeah, probably, yeah, probably felt very personal. Very personal, almost gift, mm-hmm. not only from your grandfather, but from God himself, almost. Yeah. So, yeah. Pat, as we're turning the corner here, I'm thinking about those who might be connecting to your story, those who are just very, very cerebral in a good way, you know, intellectual, deep thinker, someone who doesn't mind doing due diligence or just even looking at you and going, wow, he really... He really looked at this honestly and deeply and uh, and found it to be true and real and life-giving, it sounds like. And I wondered what you would say to someone who was listening in who might actually be open to consider God, whereas they may not have before. Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful, <clears throat> it's a wonderful question. And, uh, there's actually a book that I liked very, very much. I, I discovered it later on, but I always felt like if I had this book sooner, I felt like maybe it would have uh, sped things along a little bit. And it's uh, it's a book by a, a friend of mine, Dr. Michael Rhoda, and it's called Taking Pascal's Wager. And um, the reason I like this book a lot is he not only like updates Pascal's Wager and makes it sophisticated um, and incorporates contemporary findings of the, the positivity of religious belief and in the here and now life, not just the, the potential for the for the hereafter. But he does a really nice job of presenting what he thinks is the is the cumulative case for Christianity. So if people are interested in uh, in the the philosophical and historical perspective done by a professional philosopher in a way that's that's careful and, and nuanced um, and argues that you don't need it to be proven with 100% certainty. And of course, there's philosophers out there that think you can get an extremely high degree of confidence in these things. But the way he presents Pascal's wager is he says, hey, if you think that this is like 50-50, right, then it becomes eminently rational. And this is Rhoda's advice, becomes eminently rational to at least begin a life of religious seeking. He doesn't say you have to believe it because, you know, you can't just switch your beliefs overnight. But, you know, consider the arguments, and he presents different arguments from fine-tuning and first-cause arguments in the historical case for Christianity and discusses the problem of evil and hiddenness in, I think, a really fine way that's, again, thorough but also accessible for people who might not be professional philosophers. And, in, and you know, and says, you know, look, given what you have to gain versus what you have to lose, 
Uh, if you think that this is at least, you know, a toss up <laughs> between Christianity and atheism, right? What you should do is you should begin a life of religious seeking. You should start to pray even as an agnostic. There's, you can pray as an agnostic. God, if there is a God, save my soul if I have a soul. You know, go start hanging out around Christian people, talking with. And this is sort of what I did almost at some point and anyways, right? I just, I, I sort of began that life of really just seeking. Um, and the reason I like it is he's not saying believe it. Because that's very hard. To, as somebody converted myself, it's very hard just to switch your beliefs overnight, right? right? You say, just, you know, create a new disposition for yourself. Right. In what you're reading, you know, how you're speaking, who you're speaking to, who you're hanging around with and let things just sort of happen from there. And I always felt that that was very tender and, and brilliant advice. So I think I'd just like to um, offer that from Dr. Michael Rhoda. It's called Taking Pascal's Wager for people who want both the practical and intellectual side of that. I always found that book to be um really, really well written. That sounds like great advice. And for, for as someone who obviously was an atheist for quite a long time, really. Um, and, and now you're a Christian, how would you advise us to, to engage thoughtfully or meaningfully or lovingly or in whatever way yeah. with those who don't believe to make belief, more attractive so that they will actually look to see, yes. you know, it is really the best explanation for reality. Yeah, that is a wonderful question. And it's something that I have had to reflect on um, in my own, obviously wanting to do that, wanting to, to share Christianity with other people. And what I've come to realize is there's broadly sort of two types of, of skeptics. And I want to say this with as much charity as possible. There's a skeptic that I was which was just a confused person, right? Somebody who really wanted to know what reality was about, if it could be understood. And I rejected religion insofar as I thought it was not a good grand narrative. It was not a good story. But I wasn't hostile to religion. I never had a bad religious experience. I never suffered abuse by religious people. I was never picked on or, or any of that. So I didn't have an issue of the will towards religion. But the truth is there are a lot of skeptics out there who do have an issue of the will toward religion. It is not, it is not, or not just an intellectual problem. So my mistake was I thought that everybody was a skeptic like me, right? <laughs> I thought, well, if we just sit down and talk about this for long enough and, uh, you know, um, and that's not the case. People are more complicated. And mine, again, as I said, was not just an intellectual conversion. There's a lot going on there, but I can at least fairly say I did not have any, major issues of religion, either personally or in terms of like political perspectives or anything like that. I just, I, I didn't have that hostility for whatever reason, justified or not justified towards religion. So I think I was in a position where I was sort of kind of like the ideal agnostic or skeptic that, you know, once I read enough and heard enough of the arguments that there wasn't some yeah major issue of the will there, right? So if you find people like that, great. Arguments, philosophical conversation, apologetics, good. But we cannot, it's not just the matter of what is said, but the manner in how we present themselves. Yeah. And this is what covers everybody else, right? There are going to be people who have had very bad experiences or for other reasons are committed against religion and often tends to be political, if we're being honest. So what do you, what do, you do? You have to be the example, right? You have to be ready, yes to give a reason for the hope that was within you, but always doing it with that gentleness and respect. And be, and this is where I, I talked about my my one friend before, I think influentially more than I realized at the time, she was not a philosopher, didn't think about these questions as philosophers do. But there was a, a radiance about her and the life she lived and her pursuit of just wanting to, to be a saint that I found really kind of quite admirable and and beautiful. So I think that's the other other side of it is living that Christian life, um, understanding that for a lot of people, it's not just about giving arguments. It's very easy for those who are sort of philosophically minded to just want to get into debate mode and just clobber people with with facts and logic or whatever people say these days. Right. Uh, but I've realized that's that the usefulness is actually somewhat limited of that. It's the life you live overall, how you interact with other people, how you treat other people and building those relationships and friendships first that makes it so you can actually 
that, that gives you the fertile ground for conversations that then can be productive. And that's a lesson I've, I've had to learn <laughs> and relearn many times uh, over the years. So I would just say, whatever that lesson is, try to keep it in mind. No, that, that is a perfect uh, way to kind of close. And your intuitions about and thoughts about that are exactly what I've found in, in speaking and researching former atheists. And um, it seemed to me that the majority were moved towards openness by the question is, does God matter rather than does God exist? And that they moved towards, because of a change in the will, because they saw something that was attractive, that they wanted, that they were lacking. And then they were willing to determine whether or not it was true rather than the other way around. Although, like you say, there are those who are very more intellectually bent and 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 are, are really driven to to make intellectual sense uh, but it is the combination of the both but i appreciate your nuancing there because i think a lot of us are um, right-hearted but maybe wrong-headed just to present an argument when there's really something else going on so um anyway thank you wow what a story. Pat, what a privilege it is to have spoken with you. You have brought so much depth um, and life, I think, to this conversation. You can, you can, you are a picture of your beautiful counter narrative to, to the statement that belief in God is irrational. You are the living <laughs> contradiction to that uh, because you have demonstrated both through your intentional journey intellectually, but also understanding how it affects uh, how ideas have consequences, how you can't just hold something theoretically and and just go along and try to have sense in your life. You really do have to be honest and be willing to change your path when things aren't going the right direction or when they aren't, you know, making sense. It reminds me of uh, a statement that C.S. Lewis said something to the effect of if you're going down the wrong path, it's not going to do you any good to keep going down the wrong path. At some point, you know, it makes more sense to turn around and, and figure out the right path. And and that's what you've done. And and I, I, I know that so many listeners are going to be um, inspired by you, motivated, and maybe even challenged um, by by your journey. And I hope in a good way. So thanks so much for coming on today and, and, and telling us your story. I, I almost wish we had just a lot more time because there's so much I think we could still tease out, but we'll come to a close now. But thank you so much, Pat. Thank you, Janet. It's been an absolute joy. Really appreciate it. Thanks for tuning into Cybe Stories to hear Pat Flynn's story. In the episode notes, you can find out more about his podcasts, his recommended resources, and his soon-to-be-released book, Called the Best Argument for God. For questions and feedback about this episode, you can contact me through our email info at cybestories.com. Also, if you're a skeptic or atheist who would like to connect with a former atheist with questions, please contact us again at our email info at cybestories.com. This podcast is produced through the C.S. Lewis Institute with our wonderful producer, Ashley Decker, our audio engineer, Mark Rosera, you can also see these podcasts in video form on our YouTube channel through the excellent work of our video editor, Kyle Polk. I hope you enjoyed it and that you'll follow, rate, review, and share this podcast with your friends and social network. In the meantime, I'll be looking forward to seeing you next time where we'll see how another skeptic flips the record of their life.